Good morning, good afternoon, and evening baseball fans. This is Carl. I am joined by Chris Clemmer, and welcome to the Wednesday Barstool Baseball National League Headline Roundup Show. Is that is that what we're calling it, Chris? I think it's the official name, yes. It rolls <laughs> off a ton. Nothing easier to say than that. So smooth. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, this is our Wednesday show. We obviously we do power rankings on Monday, American League on Friday. This is Wednesday, so this is the National League Wednesday show. Uh, we're going to be joined later in the show by Michael Cerami from Bleacher Nation. He is a foremost Cubs expert. Uh, we're going to do a huge dive into the NL Central. Cubs, Cardinals, playoff odds, contentions, all that stuff. Uh, that's a good deep dive coming up. But first, um, let's get around the National League for a little bit. I want to spend some time on stuff that we missed in the power rankings, some stories that bubble up. Uh, I know you are jonesing to talk about Scherzer. Before. Yeah, uh, there's one. I, I read a byline. I just wanted to share this with people out there, National League fans. There's a guy in in the National League before. His name's Nick Lodolo. One out of every three fly balls he gives up is a home run, but he still has uh, like a positive. He's still very good at, at this year if you look at his statistics. Uh, so that's my player of the week. I want you guys to call go go look at his uh, Fangraphs page. Nick Lodolo. Is, a, is an amazing fan grabs page. He was supposed to pitch Thursday against my Mets, but they uh, pushed him, they scratched him because I think he's got a bad ankle or something. So the, so we're not going to face him on Thursday now. Um, you got to be careful with ankles because ankles will lead to bad elbows because you can't that, land or push that's off exactly, as strong. That's exactly what happened to Johan Santana. Everyone thinks Johan uh, blew his arm out with the no-hitter. It's not really true. What happened was, actually, it was against the Cubs. Right before the All-Star game, uh, someone stepped on his ankle it affect up his uh, mechanics, and then he blew out his arm. I, the mo- number one story in baseball right now is Wilson Contreras <laughs> and the Cardinals. There's no question about it. We talk about that a lot with Mike. Um, so I'm pissed off about the Mets, but what do you, what do you have what, what, do you, what do you have that's your big story with the National League? Right yeah, now? no, I, I jumped the gun on it. I was just very interested. I just wanted to give people enough because, like, I'm going to forget. I wrote this down. I was like, I want people to look at Nick Lodolo's fan graphs page with me. I'm getting more into – uh, like the research and stuff and getting back into Excel with the CFB files. I put together a little segment before we get to Michael called the five most average guys in baseball with a power with like a proprietary ranking thing. Okay. I think is pretty interesting. So I want, I want to like get it out there now that like I'm getting more into, obviously I know these stats I've written about them for, I can talk about them, but from the perspective of working data, from having a database, from loading players in uh, and going through different metrics and stuff, I'm fucking dialed in. I just want to put the beacon out there. Like I'm doing, I'm doing what I need to be doing. So whatever you give me right now, it's Scherzer and Verlander and whatever the fuck is going on with the New York Mets. I'm telling you the research I'll put together in follow-ups tight, very tight. Well, right the now. only research you need with, with the Mets uh, pitching staff is uh, a medical degree. Um, so uh, this is a fucking nightmare. So Max Scherzer <laughs> is supposed to pitch today. Well, first off, let's go back to Monday. Excuse me. People hearing this on Wednesday. Well, Monday, uh, this weird story started popping up. Now, Monday was an off day for the Mets, uh, who had played a horrific series against the Rockies, whatever. Monday, uh, all of a sudden, it's like, Max is like, oh, I'm trying hard not to go on the IL. Like, what the fuck is that coming from? Basically, he's saying his scapula still hurts him. He also has some other nagging injuries as well. Comes out this morning. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, wait a second. Uh, David Peterson's in town. Okay, Why? And ends up, sure enough, Scherzer gets scratched with neck spasms. He didn't get put in the IL. So is it a long-term thing? We don't know. Uh, could he be put in the IL tomorrow? Possibly. The way this season's going, probably. I don't know. We have Verlander going uh, on Wednesday um, against Hunter Green. Um, the Reds, meanwhile, beat us 7-6 to six on Tuesday in a game that if we just had decent starting pitching, we would have won. Instead, you have... David Peterson get knocked around again. He sucks. He's one in five. ERA is ginormous. And then we have uh, Nogasek come in, and he 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 lights it up on fire too. It's just the Mets have no middle relief. The Mets have a starting rotation that's in tatters, and we are in the easiest part of our schedule all season. And we are now one in six in the middle of a stretch. I thought we go nine and four. So this is a disaster. This is really bad. It's not the end. It's not like Frank the Tank. It's the end of the world, necessarily. I do think the division's out of reach. We are now eight games back of the Braves. We're not going to catch them. It's over. Uh, I'm, I'm waving the white flag. It's done. Well, 
What about this though? Max free just goes to the IL 15 days, but that's going to be a 60 day thing. Yeah. It's not a UCL, but there's still issues yet. He, he had Tommy John in 14 when he was a Padres prospect. He's really settled in. He's, he's maybe not the most dominant, like because he's standing next to Spencer Strider. But if you need seven innings and two runs, with six strikeouts and a walk, Max Freed's standing there. And the fact that he's out means other guys, Kyle Wright's a little funky. Bryce Elder's going to be making. I know he's pitched well, but he's only made like 16 or 17 career starts. If there's any holes, I guess, with the Braves, it's like it starts with Max Freed. It could go with like another guy start to – that's really – now I'm saying this. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but if I was a Mets fan, that's really your only path to division because up and down their lineup except for a shortstop. I mean, Austin Riley's league average this year – and like they're eight games above 500. He's like every bit of league average and they're like, wait till he starts cooking. Like he's yeah. not, come on. I mean, Bryce Elder is, has a 174 ERA, you know, Charlie Morton's almost my age and he's got a 338 ERA. Like, you know, these guys, it doesn't matter who, who they throw out there. They, they're, they're, we talked about it on the rundown show we did uh, on Sunday, the panel show that came out on Monday. Uh, but like the Braves just have such, the Braves and Rays have such a great, uh, baseball ops situation. There are just so many levels above everybody else. Everybody else is trying to play catch up. So even when you lose Max Freed, who Carl, you're absolutely right. He's one of the, but you got to figure one of the 20 best pitchers in baseball. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and you could probably go a little bit higher if there aren't the injury concerns, but he fucking balls out, man. He's incredible. And so you're right. That's, and that's a big story that, uh, for any other team, I think would shake it to the core, but I, I have confidence the Braves can beat that. Like I said, they have they're playing six ninety four baseball right now. They have they're eight games ahead of us. They're eight games ahead of everybody in the division. So right now, I'm looking at the wild card as our best bet for the Mets, and uh, we need for us to be successful. You're going to need Verlander to look like he did the last year, uh, not like he did against the Tigers, but look like he did the last year. Sanga to keep it up, and then we might need to go out there and get a Giolito or an Erod or someone to fill in these gaps. Cause right now that rotation is not playoff caliber. No, now in the rest of the NL East too, you know, it's not that you guys are just like, you guys are certainly underperforming expectation wise. Yeah. But like the Marlins aren't horrendous. The no. Phillies still have a gear, a complete another gear to get to now that Bryce Harper's back and that'll take a little bit of time. And um, that's the troubling aspect. Like if everybody was playing really well, you know that they're going to come down at some point, but but if we're talking yeah. wild card, the Diamondbacks are playing better, right? You still have Zach Gallon. You still, you know, they, they still have Corbin Carroll. They have great players there. You know, the Padres they haven't hit that next gear. I think we all feel they're going to. They've won six of their last ten. They're they're gonna. The Padres are gonna be good. Uh, and then you know the Brewers, they're they're if they win the Central, but what, your Cubs, which we're going to talk about them with Mike, but like they're. You know, a couple of days go right for them. I could see them winning 86, 88 games. If if everything kind of breaks their way, the Mets are starting to – they need to do some things right real fast because that schedule gets really tough after next week. It gets much harder for the next like, couple months. You know, it's tough when you're, when you're corner outfield production in DH, so and educate me a little bit, but Canna and Marte are getting regular playing time, right? Yes, they are so underperforming expectation from in in can is still average. Marte's OPS plus, I think, is hovering under 70, which is like that guy, he just can't do that. Like he cannot be playing every single day unless he's a threat to the baseball. You're absolutely right. So Canna is Canna, right? That kind of is who he is, and that's fine. He's probably best suited to be a fourth outfielder, but fine, whatever. The Marte thing is complicated. So uh by the second week of the season, he hurt his neck. Uh, on a collision play. And um, he hasn't quite looked right since then. I think it's really affected his play. I kind of wish he'd go on the IL because you're absolutely right, Carl. He's been horrible this year. Awful. He's been bad defensively. There's a play in uh, Detroit. He missed a, a, a fly ball that would have basically kind of really helped the Mets win the game. He missed it. It was a 90% stat cast that most people <laughs> catch it. Now, Marte is a very good fielder. The fact that he ran such a strange route tells me something's wrong. But the biggest issue is Vogelback. Now, Vogelback on his own is a fine hitter, whatever. But when you have a guy that can only bat against righties, he can't play the field. He can't run. Vogelback needs to be on the Royals like or a team like that, where he just DHs, has 600 plate appearances. He hits 30 home runs, whatever, whatever, 25. And that's fine. The team's not going anywhere. It's fine. But on a competitive team, 
he doesn't fit. Because if you play against the lefty, it's almost like you're playing a man down. You can't use him to pinch run. You can't use him defensively. He doesn't do anything. He just sits in the bench. It's the, the roster is not built right. And the bullpen, I keep going back to it, that Mets bullpen is a disaster. It's a real problem. And I don't know if it gets fixed because we don't have anyone in Syracuse or AAA who can come up and pitch. Uh, we don't have any pitching prospects. Now, the bright side is, and I don't know how detached Mets fans are from reality, but as a as a baseball fan rooted in it, like sometimes it takes a long time to get it right. The nice thing about the Mets, other than obviously Steve Cohen's money, is the contracts that are tied up, like fine, Scherzer or Verlander, say they don't work out. Guess what, dude? You have $90 million to spend in, in a year and a half. Like, and, and he can spend more than that. And it's not like your problems are, listen, when I saw Jason Hayward play fucking 60 games for the Cubs, you were looking at that contract going, how, how long? Yeah. How, how long? So a lot of the money short term, the long term money is good money. You know, Nimmo showed up. He's played well. Fl- Lindor showed up. Lindor's a great, Lindor's the shortstop shortstop in Major League Baseball. He's the fucking guy. If you, if you vote, if you had shortstop say, who, would, who should play in the All-Star game, they all vote for Lindor. You know, Pete Alonso, it, it's, he's the perfect guy to extend, and, and they should just do it and put him in the books. Um, there's some compelling aspects there where you guys can turn around. You guys suck this year right now. You guys are fucking terrible. My point is, are you guys going to be terrible for the next five? Is this is this a feudal decade ahead of you? No, no not no. at all. No, and, no, and you no. know, Lindor, Lindor had a big home run today. I, I, I know he's, he hasn't quite measured up to what he, we hope for him statistically, but I think he'll be just fine. One positive note, uh, Francisco Alvarez had two home runs today. He's been tearing the cover off the ball the last two weeks. He's really the only Met that's hitting. Um, Brett Beatty has come up. He's He's been kind of hot and cold, but he's so far has been decent. So there are some positive lights, I guess. There's very few of them, though. This team has been a complete disaster for the most part this season. 17 and 19 now. I mean, if you had told oh, yeah. me that on March 12th, I wouldn't have believed you. But think about it. Edwin Diaz goes down. Berlander's made one start all year. Scherzer has an ERA of five and a half. Um, this has been a, a, I keep calling it, it's been a walking nightmare. Brett Beatty's been better than Gunnar Henderson. I know this is the National League show, but that's got to be a win for Mets fans. All people talked about was Gunnar. Is if you put him in the, th- maybe I'm wrong, but just no, try and find some small wins. You got Buck Walter behind it, you know. This team, this Mets team started off 14 and 7. So that means they've gone 3 and 12 the last 15 games. That's tough to look for positivity after a stretch like that. I'd it's, rather have it come in May than fucking August and in September. So losses all count the same. I, I am, uh, and I said, this is a very easy stretch right now. This is, this was our time to make hay. And we're not. We're getting beat. I don't know what happens when we play. We play the Rays next week. Uh, yeah, the Rays come to City Field Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, what happens then? You're we there on the assignment. Rays. You're there on assignment. I'll be there Tuesday. On a, yeah. Okay. Good. I'll be there Tuesday. I'll be. I'll be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna turn to Frank the Tank by the by the end of that race series. Ed. Hmm. That would be an interesting pivot. Uh, my my personal preference would be. Stay you, Clemmer. That's what I want. Don't let, the, you, don't let the Mets do this to you. Don't let them. The Braves are too good for the Mets to do this to you right now. All right? That's what's that's something that, and we're going to get to Cubs cards in a little bit, but that was something that helped me when the cards just ran it down my fucking throat for the better part of a decade and a half. It's just like, the, it, what are you going to do? They got Chris Carpenter. And when they don't have Chris Carpenter, they have Adam Wainwright. And yep. they got Albert Pujols. They got Yadier Molina behind the plate. Like, that. They. Kyle Loesch is a stud when they need him to be a stud. Right, Fucking right. Jared Weaver. Jeff Weaver. Jeff. Not even Jared. Right. Jeff. Jeff. Right. Je- <laughs> he balled out no six. All right. So um, I I understand the sentiment with the Mets. Just stay positive. Do the best you can. And here's your first challenge. I want to go out to the NL West real quick before we get yeah. to the Central in a deep dive. And so I was, I was looking at Juan Soto and – it's it's really interesting that if you look at his heat maps, the coldest part, the coldest part is right down the middle of the plate. And the explanation for that is, I guess the entire league has committed to throwing Juan Soto heavy horizontal break over the middle of the plate. Like that's the hole in his swing. Because if you pitch him down and in, he's going to yank it. He pulls way more. Ever since the news that he was going to get $450 million came out, he just went way pole heavy. 
uh, wants to hit for power. I don't know if it's a San Diego thing. I don't know if that's him getting out of the Nationals or the Nationals coached him a certain way. Matt Williams was in that dugout for a little bit when he was a young kid. A uh, lot of moving parts with Juan Soto, but my long-winded way of saying the most interesting thing is his heat maps because it he's just getting the same type of stuff and he won't he won't adjust. That said, the on base is still through the roof. His OPS plus is still the third best on the Padres. Um, what do you make of what do you make of this Juan Soto since coming to San Diego? And and do you think it's as big of a deal or is it just a funky game and he's ready to explode? Yeah, it's it's kind of baffling. Um, so just I, I'm not a big batting average guy, but just let's look at it for a quick second. With the Nationals, he's a 291 batting average. 87 games with the Padres, it's 230. Um, but you're absolutely right, though. The walks haven't changed, right? Like, he's leading the National New York walks. He already has 32 walks in 35 games this year. So what's going on? Um, I don't entirely know. When you tell when you tell me player X, let's just take one side of it. Player X has his cold area is down the middle. I say, all right, that's a streaky thing. Then That, that will resolve itself. Um, it's not like he's constantly, you know, chasing balls in the dirt, like you see with some young players, like Alvarez when he came up, right? Like you can throw him anything outside the zone, he'll swing. It's not that. So it also is incredibly disciplined, right? So what's going on? Why isn't? And I don't, I don't know. Obviously, if I knew, I'd be wouldn't be talking to you, Carl. I'd be making a lot more money somewhere. But <laughs> it is strange as someone who likes to look at trends, and I'm a big believer in like age and like patterns. He's 24. So, you know, guys <laughs> in his age are just coming up to the major leagues, and Juan Soto has 130 career home runs. So it's it's such a weird – he's such a unicorn anyway. So you have to try to, like, understand what's happening with him. Is he just kind of going through this weird motion thing? The, my gut and my brain both tell me that this is a temporary thing. We'll see the real Juan Soto sooner rather than later. He's too young. He's too talented. And the issues he have, I believe, are things that can be fixed. But with each passing day, if I was a Padres fan, I'd be getting awfully impatient. Now, I think he's <clears> – <throat> it's great analysis, by the way. I should say that up front. Um, where I think it's really turning is this adjustment process where there's another adjustment level that's being introduced to Major League Baseball because of advances in pitch design. So the, the way that pitchers can take an off season and work through data and pitch grips and specialists on really like perfecting the most optimal pitch mix and what works best for you. And that's been going on for a little bit. And I think that's gotten to a point now where pitchers can really now look at a player like Juan Soto in reverse engineer. Now I'm not saying guys are going to the off season, like how do I get Juan Soto out? But you better believe that's a broader thing of like what pitches work against players that are this fit this profile. And from my re my research, I should say, from a wonderful article on baseball prospectus uh, and ancillary research from StatCast performed on my own, um, it's, a, it's amazing how, how substantial his outcomes have changed, even though side by side this year, last year, historically, pitchers are still attack in a nine quadrant zone. Yeah. The ratios are still almost identical. You know, 9% here, 16% yep. here. They haven't made a wholesale change where, like, now they're pounding him inside and he's had to expand his zone outside. The thing that has changed is the pitches that are being thrown to him and the quality of those pitches uh, in the exact specificity with, like, you know, the sweeper, sleeper, slutter, whatever. You know, and I'm learning new. Right. You know, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in a fucking front office. I'm sitting here watching on TV, too, going, what the fuck is a sweeper? Um, but it's created, it's, it's exposed a hole in Juan Soto's swing that in the composites, the launch angles down, but the launch, but the, the hard hit rates up. And so, yeah, let me throw a quick, just hole into that theory, which I don't think is entirely wrong, but if that was true, then wouldn't every other, wouldn't we see that with other power hitters too? I feel like we're, or other elite players like Mike Trout, still Mike Trout. Like you know, Nolan Mike Arenado. No one has back injury. No one also, you could be saying third basemen also don't age the same. So third basemen age very quickly compared to other positions. It's not like catcher, but it's much more than a first baseman or a left fielder or a right fielder. That's why there aren't many third basemen in the Hall of Fame. It's hard to be a third baseman. 
With Juan Soto, though, where he's 24 and he's having this weird kind of like pre-life crisis when it comes to his contact, I don't know what it is. I'm not saying that theory is wrong. I'm just saying if it, I don't think it's a universal theory because we'd see it affect more hitters. I, I, but having said that, I, I'm I'm out of answers with him. I just think he's so good and he hasn't lost time due to injury. I think this will resolve itself. But I think you're one of the things you mentioned, though, Carl. It might be he just might need the right hitting coach. He might need someone to kind of teach him the best way to kind of get that bat in the ball or be more aggressive. Someone he respects, tell him, you know what, Juan? Stop trying to walk every time up. Stop trying to be Daniel Vogelback. Try to be Dave Kingman just for a week. Let's see what happens. And and maybe that's kind of what he needs. I don't know. Um, but like I said, this is more than a small sample size. We have 87 games. And honestly, if you look at how we started the year last year with Washington, he was that player too. He batted 246 for Washington last year. This contact issue has been a, a year. We're on a year and a half now where he hasn't been the one Soto that we, we know. I should, uh, I should correct myself. I brought up Matt. I brought up Matt Williams. Matt Williams is a manager yeah. for the Nationals. He got, he got, he got, he got fired before Juan Soto got yeah, there. He, he is currently the third base coach for the Padres, though. So he is influencing Juan right. Soto. Well, he, but, yeah, he, but, but the broader point is there's somebody there. And, and the specific thing for Juan Soto is he's stepping in the bucket. He's pulling off. He's trying to pull it hard. The, the using the big parts of the field, hitting it back at the middle, that is what has gone away from his approach. That's the thing that's fleeting. So who is the person that says to him, like, hey, man, you know, we – you know, power numbers get you paid and all that shit. Like you probably had a ton of success in the nationals mm-hmm. and the playoffs against the Astros spinning off on inside fastballs and shit. But um, we need you to pepper that left center gap. Now, if that happens, you know, I, I think it's like losing weight. I think it's like, he has to realize that himself. Like, I don't know how many people can stand there and tell him like, Hey man, you're, you'd be better off if you lost a couple pounds. It's not until he's standing in the mirror, looking at his fucking swing going, Jesus, dude, how'd you, how'd you let yourself get this? The walk rate, though, let's get back to that. That walk rate's elite. Uh, yeah. And the Padres, they, they're ready to pop. We talked about the Dodgers a lot on the power rankings panel. They got, into the, they got into the mix for the first time this year. We've talked a lot about the Diamondbacks. Um, Big week there by the Dodgers, too. Beat the Brewers 6-2. to two. The, the Dodgers are just – they're just fucking good. I mean, <laughs> it's, that, it's that simple. I mean, they're just, they're, just, they're just good. I mean, you know, every year they – I mean – this is a stretch that I know they haven't had the playoff success. I honestly, I feel like I'm, I'm a kid again, talking about the Braves a little bit. Um, you know, this is kind of how people talk for younger people. This is how people talk about the Braves in the nineties. It was like the Braves are good every year, but damn, they don't win enough. And um, I, you know, you wonder if, I don't know, I don't know when the window closes for the Dodgers, but this is, you know, this is exactly how people talk about the Braves in 1998 is how we talk about the Dodgers in 2023. I do like connecting that dot. Uh, that Braves, the 13 division titles in a row still as a sports fan. I mean, incredible, but they only got one ring, you know, and, you know, I, 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 you know, Dodgers it's have one ring. It's tough, man. I mean, what it's hard. Would you rather be a Marlins fan with two rings? No, I'd rather be a Braves fan with one. Come on. Yeah, that's fair. Um, that's kind of an extreme though, right? Uh, you know, or would you rather be a Cardinals fan that has had the success and, the, you know, a couple rings? I don't, but we are going to talk about the Cardinals in depth. We're going to talk about yeah. the Cubs in depth. Um, this is the Barstool Baseball Wednesday National League headline roundup show. I will get an acronym for that. Um, we're now going to bring in a guy that I have followed for years. I consider him a tremendous internet baseball guy, which is different than like the qualified journalistic, you know, in the locker. He's watching games just like us. He's insider. But Bleacher Nation does a tremendous job. It's a, it's a throwback old school blog um, that's relentless around the clock coverage uh, for Chicago sports and in particular the Cubs. So Michael's going to join us here. Uh, Chris has some great questions. We're going to get into the NL Central, some of the races that line up. And I just want to, before we get to Michael, thank him for joining us because he's, uh, as you're going to find out, knows a ton about the Cubs. He's got a good outlook on it. And it's good to just talk to baseball fans, right? Oh, it's just a fun deep dive in National Central. Like, I think, uh, you know, Michael and Carl, too, like, they both really know the stuff around the Cubs and the Cardinals. And it was just a fun deep dive into a division that I know for myself. I think Barstool, too, to some extent, we don't pay enough attention to. So it was nice. You know, obviously, Chicago, we do. But I feel like the Pirates and 
uh, you know, we even talked about everyone in the division. I feel like we had like a good conversation, but um, a conversation that I, I enjoyed a lot because I've I learned a lot. Yeah. And as we're building out the programming for our school baseball, like, you know, Clummer and I talked before the show, and we're like, I think this is a good way, you know, to, to go about it. We'll do a little bit around, let's do a deep dive. So next week we'll come back, we'll get deep on other divisions and stuff. But this week is the NL Central stuff because Wilson Contreras is such a huge story. The uh, biggest you know, story. The, I, I, yeah, I mean, and the Cardinals are falling apart, and they, but now they're winning a little bit. So uh, let's get deep. Let's talk to Michael. Um, when, I got to have – what's it? You do the transition. What, what should we say now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, I'm the worst person in the world at this. Uh, Brandon Walker always gives me shit for it. Uh, here it is, a tremendous, tremendous discussion <laughs> with Michael Sarami. Actually, it, 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 he's very good. Uh, Carl's good, and then I ask some questions. Enjoy. All right, we're now joined by Michael Cerami uh, from Bleacher Nation. And as I said in the introduction, uh, one of my favorite Cub follows. Michael, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So as we said off top, you are the, you're in charge of Bleacher Nation, or can we just get like a credibility statement from you up front? Like where can people find your stuff? <laughs> yeah, you can find my stuff at Bleacher Nation um, and on Twitter at Michael underscore Cerami. Uh, Brett, the guy who started Bleacher Nation, is still there writing about the Cubs. Uh, but we've recently sold, and so he's kind of taking a step back, right, and doing only Cub stuff, and I'm sort of running the business that is Bleacher Nation and doing a little bit of – keep doing my Cub stuff on the side, you know, as I as we keep going. So for people that have followed me for a number of years, Michael is one of my foremost, like when I want to know what's going on. You guys do a tremendous job, uh, certainly in the weeds from a fan perspective, something I very much relate to. Um, I've enjoyed getting to know Brett over the years. Obviously, love your stuff. So we wanted to bring you in just to have like a, a little bit deeper dive. It's one thing for me to sit here and hammer on the Cubs, but um, you're real close. And one of the biggest stories, obviously, is Wilson Contreras. So from your perspective, like how did the Cubs get to the point where he signed with St. Louis? Yeah, so um, in a weird way, it started to feel like in this position, I've like evolved on this. I think they kind of did him a favor last year. So the Cubs clearly started uh, going, wanting to go in a different direction behind the plate, right? So they had Contreras for a long time, offense first catcher, um, really, really great offensive catcher, probably one of the top three over the last five years, you know, maybe more. Um, and it started to come out slowly but surely and, and seemingly not from the Cubs that he wasn't quite doing the stuff behind the plate that they wanted him to do the kind of stuff that led to him being ousted as the Cardinals catcher after a month, after they gave him $90 million for five years. So, you know, I think it was, it was handled well, but it definitely was uh, a little confusing until we sort of started to realize like, man, maybe there is a lot of soft factor stuff. Um, that's it's goes beyond framing pitches. You know, it's, it's about calling games. Um, it's about working with pitchers. It's about preparation, knowing what to call in certain times of the game. Uh, and clearly, you know, the worst part about this is like, it's just making Yadier Molina look better. It's like, God, maybe, maybe we kind of slept on that entire aspect of catching for too long because we wanted Wilson to be that guy. Cause we, I, I mean, I loved him. He's, he's the man, um, all the stuff, all the shit he's doing to, to Aegon Cubs fans this week is what he did for us for six years. And it was great. Um, so it's definitely all about, uh, his work as a catcher, um, and again, that extends so far beyond framing or throwing guys out. Uh, and it just, it's just, it's not the direction they wanted to go. They switched to Jan Gomes and Tucker Barnhart, two veterans who are known for that exact stuff. And, uh, you know, it's trying to rebuild that Miguel Montero, David Ross thing they had in 15 and 16. Yeah, let me, can I ask you, I want to ask both of you a question. Buster only had a um, especially idiotic tweet over the weekend here. And he said the Cubs handling of Contreras vindicated by this decision. Uh, they carefully protected his value last season, effectively swapped him for draft capital passed on, on a reunion. I disagree with that. I think that, yes, I think it vindicates the idea that the Cubs didn't re-sign Contreras. But I don't think it has any bearing on you guys uh, not trading him uh, before the deadline. I think, you, I think that missed a real opportunity to make the Cubs, especially considering the Cubs look pretty decent this year, I think you missed a real opportunity to make them even better for 2023 last year, if that makes any sense. I think that was one of the biggest surprises was why they didn't move him. And, and ultimately, the decision I made, I'm interested in Michael's perspective on this, is that the front office must have just said the return and compensation if he signs with another team based on his status 
like what they get in the draft pick back. So I think it was like the 50th something pick. It's a mid to second after second round compensation pick for him signing with the Cardinals. They must have looked at the value of that pick and said that's more valuable than what, you know, the Mets or whatever. Hey, he'd look great in a Mets uniform. I'll say that, Clemmer. Yeah, no, you guys are – so you're both right. First of all, huge, it sucks that they couldn't trade him, and they would have loved to have traded him. I know for a fact that what they were getting uh, offered was not anywhere close to what we were thinking that they were going to get. And the third thing there, the parts that was like what you said, Clemmer, and what you said, Carl, and then what the next part is, is it's because some people around the league already knew what the Cubs knew and what the Cardinals just found out the hard way is that he's not a great catcher to handle a pitching staff. And that is like three times harder and worse when you're trying to enter a new pitching staff for a playoff run with two months left in the season. So if you're already not known for being like this high preparation, like like high baseball IQ catcher, and you're going to a brand new team with a new pitching coach, new pitching infrastructure, new game plan calling, all of that, well, then they're not going to want to filter you in. So you're really limited to guys, teams that are looking for someone that they, you know, maybe a DH that could catch occasionally. And there was way fewer options out there. And like the Astros were one, but they got, uh, mm-hmm. what's his name from uh, Boston, right? And, yeah, Vasquez. Uh, Vasquez, yeah. And uh, so, I mean, that was it then. And so the Mets were the other team. Um, you know, I would say they still probably needed Contreras, needed his bat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I know that what they were offering was a lot lower than like what everyone had in mind for this three time all star catcher that's got, you know, just a couple months to go in a lowish salary. Yeah. So, like, it just didn't come together. So, Clemmer, let me ask you from an outsider perspective, how, how much do you think this Wilson Contreras to DH and away from the pitching staff is a big deal? Yeah. So, okay. So, I, I'm trying to think of this from a historical element so like Mike Piazza right I'm a Mets fan so Mike Piazza great obviously one of the greatest offensive catchers ever but one of the worst defensive catchers you know it, as far as big names that you can think of obviously there's, there's smaller guys but Mike Piazza is fairly well known as a terrible defensive catcher but like he went to the Mets and the Mets still had guys like Al Leiter uh Bobby Jones you know other guys who ha- still had competitive Mike Hampton still had good years with the Mets I don't know if I've ever seen a catcher have such a negative impact instantly like Contreras has had with the Cardinals. Now, to Mike's point earlier, is this the Molina effect or is this the Contreras effect? Is this some weird merging of the two? Or is it the fact that it's fucking like May 9th and it's like we're just making too much of this? I don't know, but I will say this. Since they made this move and you guys have seen firsthand, it looks like the old Cardinals again. <sighs> They've won a couple games. You, you I know, but they're winning it the right way. Though. I know, like, you're right. You know, You're right. He, hey, he, Flaherty went out and pitched well today. Would pitch well yeah, enough. Yeah. And that was after he, getting his fucking shit rocked in the first inning. First two balls of the game were absolute scorchers. He comes back and play. Now, Kisner behind the plate, a significant upgrade from Contreras, but a significant downgrade still from Molina. It's like you, it's like you're not only getting rid of the baseball glove that has fit your hand perfectly for years, you're putting on a brand new one that like just it's a wrong size. It doesn't fit. So guys like Wainwright, he's gonna bitch so easily. And and maybe wrong or right, he certainly feels that he has the right to pitch, you know. But like you bring in a guy like Contreras, I'll guarantee you he had a very very small threshold for what he was willing to accept behind the plate. And if other guys on the staff had a problem, they probably went right right to Wainwright. And I can see him being like, "We got to make this change right away." Trust me, it's me, Adam Wainwright. That's the only way I can justify spending eighty seven and a half million dollars on a three time All Star catcher that played in your division and then instantly pivoting away from him. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, the other thing, Mike Maddox is gone, so you got a whole new pitching coach mm-hmm. there, too. So it's it's you're losing Maddox and Molina. So the drop-off and the changes there is, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's not a surprise. Um, but, you know, from, from my perspective as a Cubs fan, it kind of feels like that, like, classic Cardinal arrogance that they think that they can just, you know, no matter what, they're going to figure it out and it's going to be fine, despite all of the signals that he wasn't this guy that they wanted him to be. Um, and actually Sadaf Sharma had a really great take on the athletic podcast recently. It was just like, you know, you can't blame Contreras for that. He focused on hitting and made $90 million. It's like, yeah, he did his, he did what was best for him. It worked out. There's guys like Jan Gomes aren't getting $90 million. Uh, it's not happening. Right. If you're a, a glove first catcher, first pitcher, first catcher. Uh, so I don't know. I, 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 I think just too much change than the drop from Molina and Maddox to Contreras and a brand new uh, pitching coach, it's a big difference. 
I, I wonder how fuck the Cardinals, honestly. Like, so now they spent $88 million on a DH that has a career slugging percentage of 457. He's 31 years old. That, if he's just a DH, that is a, without question, a horrific signing. And we already know that in the first 38 days of the deal. That's a problem for the Cardinals. And every person who's played with Wilson Contreras would tell you he's significantly better when he's out playing. Like he needs to be a part of, he's not a guy who's going to just sit. He's not that type of player to just sit around. Like, yeah, he can DH if he's, but you, that's not the type he, of person. He DH'd a lot last year though. He DH'd a lot last year. Um, and, and, you know, I, I sent a tweet a while back, so I don't have the guys off the top of my head, but he's been part of a three catcher tandem for like pretty much every year he's been with the Cubs. Um, they didn't have the DH all that time, but you know, there's been times where they've, they've had other catchers around. Like, again, it, it, it was so much blindness from I'm, from, I'm talking about myself. Like I wanted him to be better than Yachty. And when he was like talking shit, you know, and Yachty was getting mad at him, yeah. like that was the best. I loved that. And now it's like, yeah, I mean, you can obviously win a world series with him. Cubs did. Um, he was there, but he had David Ross and Miguel Montero there, mm-hmm. you know, and there, there's a lot of other guys over the years, a lot of veteran catchers that they brought in. And uh, last year, for example, his ERA with the starting staff versus Jan Gomes, it's like an insane difference, uh, much better with Gomes. And like, you don't want to just, it's it's all these little things. And any one of them, you might be like, well, you could brush that off. You could brush that off. Or listen, the guy's going to hit 20 homers and whatever. But all of a sudden it's like, okay, maybe we kind of just had our cubby blinders on for a little too long. Their loss, whatever, you know, he yeah. gets paid and hopefully it doesn't hope hurts their flexibility, I guess. I don't know. One thing lurking in the back of my head about these rule changes is the fact that Theo Epstein is the one behind him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jed Hoyer is his replacement. If you know how competitive Theo is, uh, I'll guarantee it. He wants Jed to succeed very badly so he can like it. He's just an animal. I, my point is that maybe I'm making this too long winded. I think uh, in jest that Theo tipped off Jed on the rule changes and they were able to strategize in advance on how to get ahead of them in the catcher position is one now based on stolen bases where you can value in the pitch tempo and the re- the requirement for that good rapport to move quickly and efficiently and effectively. Um, that emphasis so far drowns out the need for offense for a catcher, especially when you can now create offense from different positions in different ways where like the three outcome is, is certainly on its way out the door and we're moving more towards dynamic players. Hey, Nico Horner can steal 11 bases. I know he's out, but Again, long-winded way of saying, like, the Cubs are ahead of it by not extending Wilson Contreras, by spending it significantly less behind the plate if you're getting guys that can call good games and, and work with the staff uh, based on these rule changes. And I want to shout out Theo Epstein for getting in front of that and tipping <laughs> off Jed on how to sign these guys. And, and um, thank you, Theo. That's bizarre conspiracy theories from Carl. Um, uh, I, w- I will say, so I have a question for you guys. The, the Cubs are a very interesting team to me as a, as a, as a neutral party. Um, they were obviously pretty bad last year. They made a lot of interesting improvements, not going out and getting that big name player, but getting guys that are good players like Jameson Tyon or, or getting Bellinger. And he's really performed for you guys getting Dansby Swanson, who I would say is a big name, but like out of the shortstop pool, he was, Probably the last best shortstop, if you will. Right. So where do you guys see, A, how you've done so far this year, and B, kind of how you see the season playing out? I'm super happy you asked me that today and not a week and a half ago. So I don't <laughs> look like an absolute idiot. Uh, listen, the, 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 <laughs> I, would have, I would have been a lot more optimistic before about like 20 minutes ago. Uh, the way that this team – the way that some of the most important players on this team have performed is huge um, for this season. Let's say like Nico and Hap and Swanson and Bellinger are legit. That's top four that are performing. They have the right balance of lefty and righty and on base and power. Uh, it's been great. Trey Mancini has been a lot better uh, in the last like 75 plate appearances than he was at the cold start of the year. But until this team stops giving DH starts to Eric Hosmer, you know, and, and leading off with Nick Madrigal, even if he had two hits in tonight, like they're not going to, they're not going to do anything. Like you cannot have Eric Hosmer coming up with the bases loaded multiple times in the game. It's like, it is absurd. It is maddening. 
Um, but at the same time, I see, I mean, this team that the way they were winning early on, it, it wasn't, it wasn't that crazy. It was believable. They were not, their run differential was crazy. They're scoring tons of runs. Their starting pitching has been fantastic. And their bullpen, like there's been some rough outings, but it's a freaking bullpen. That's exactly what happens. Like they've played well and it's not going well, especially lately. So until, you know, guys like, you know, Matt Mervis, his top prospect settles in and Chris Morrell starts getting more playing time until they better protect Patrick Wisdom. Uh, like he's the, this, the holes are kind of cracking again for him um, until they start deploying those guys like more aggressively, like you're trying to win right now and not develop, not look ahead to 2024. Uh, it, they might just hover just below or around 500. And then you get to July and it's a coin flip. And if Jed feels like he wants to, sell for the third consecutive year or you know make a little push but there's a lot of talent on this team and the starting pitching has been so good that you you, the hope i still have it because you know if you have starting pitching uh you could do it and they do right now i I think i feel pretty good about it um stroman Steele and uh smiley have been awesome west nesky is turning it around and jameson tyon like he didn't have a great start tonight game two against cardinals but honestly he didn't look that bad to me and he's coming it's the second start off the il like I'm not feeling that bad about that. So when you have that much starting pitching and Hendricks is coming back through five shutout in Iowa, I don't know. You you could make some noise. You just got to hover around just above 500 mm-hmm. and the NL Central sucks. So mm-hmm. like do something. Sure. And I, I share sentiment of that optimism. It's rooted in lifelong being a Cubs fan of like, well, if we just <laughs> hang on here and there. Um, but then the reality checks in. I think the front office is grounded in reality. Like they're cold. They're ice cold. You know, Theo walked away with a year left on his deal just because it was like the right time. It was the it was the right move for him. They're willing to, you know, not bring Anthony Rizzo back when they could have brought Anthony Rizzo back. And you look in the grand scheme of things. Um, my point is like they're just there's these they're these cold blooded dudes. If they come out and they sell this at, at the break and they get rid of Stroman because he's only owed I think twenty four million dollars next year and he's pitching really well and some teams like not only would he help us now and then. Um, you know, like I, I wouldn't be, I would expect Bellinger to be on the move unless they were in, you know, some kind of like sincere battle to win the division. But then the question is, if they win the division, then what happens? Can you honestly think that this team can beat the Braves in a seven game series? Maybe five, maybe five, but yeah. they're so far away. So I'm interested in these plays and moves right now that can help them get to the top tier of baseball, which is where they need to be. And that's not going to be a place until they've got Pete Crow in center. You know, they've already made their commitment to Hap. They've made a commitment to Horner. They made a commitment to Swanson. You've locked up unbelievable defensive players, uh, especially as we see continued Manford rules. Like, that shit matters so much more and will continue over 162. So then you have to make huge splashes in free agency. You have to nail the draft. You have to invest heavily so that you can make moves like what the Rays have done with Zach Eflin. And that's just that you have to just get better in all facets. And the Cubs really just aren't they're, – they're still not there. It's not just – player development it's infrastructure development it's coming back from the Theo regime um but i'm optimistic and the name that came up matt mervis is a perfect example guy didn't get drafted cubs ride him they get him uh he was terrible his first year in minor league ball in 2021 uh, and they developed him into their everyday first baseman now so uh that's a small glimpse of things that have that matter way more than if they get shohei otani can matt mervis be a, a 35 40 home run guy in 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 solid defensively hope so I mean, yeah huge. justin Steele is inter- uh, so <coughs> just looking on paper right now he's he's an all-star he's a, has an all-star start to the season he's been incredible uh a lot of, i'm guessing a lot of people maybe who you know don't watch the cubs regularly aren't maybe aware of how good he's been this year it's interesting he comes to the majors as a 25 year old he uh is mediocre at best then he has a good year last year okay the good year last year this year, he's become a Cy Young contender. What's going on with this guy? Yeah, yeah so you know, I can go quick, and then I'd like Michael to dive into this. It's a, it's a, he's a Mississippi boy. He's not overpowering. Mississippi guys aren't like these. Uh, the body types are like what you see with Justin. He, he could walk into a bar tomorrow, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know any different that he was a big league pitcher. The competitive drive that he has, and his willingness and want to execute the pitch to get you out. Like he's at his best three, one he's at his best two Oh, like he's at his best runners on first and third. Uh, he's like a throwback. That's how I see Justin Steele. Yeah. Uh, so 
first of all, I kind of think that's spot on. And he's got, he's like the coolest dude the Cubs have right now. So <laughs> he's awesome. Uh, they, he actually was this good uh, at the end of last season too. He's got a 14 start streak of two in, uh, two earned runs or fewer, which tied Jake Arrieta's 2015 run, which Arrieta was way better at the time. But I mean, that's still an impressive yeah. feat going back to the second half of last season. And uh, a huge part of the change is he uh, talked about being like an old school guy. He, he talked to John Lester uh, after some struggling starts and John Lester told him to throw his four seamer uh, down and into righties. And he started doing that and he started absolutely dominating. And yeah, he's a, he's not a guy that's going to overpower you. He doesn't have some crazy sweeper. Like it's, it's just not his game. He just is a pitchability guy. Um, his strikeouts are up. His walks are down. But the, for him, the thing is, is he is the like prototypical Chicago Cubs of the last decade starting pitcher. He manages contact. That's all they want. They want guys that force the ball on the ground, uh, Drew Smiley, Marcus Stroman, and a ton of weak contact, Drew Smiley, Marcus Stroman. Justin Steele is like leading the league in the least amount of barrels, uh, launch angle down, exit velocity down. I mean, he is all about, I'm going to let you put the ball in play. And my defense, which has just got beefed up like crazy because that's what the Cubs focused on all off season uh, is, is going to help me uh, get deeper into games and, and succeed. And that's what, how he's done it. Um, it was a comment from Lester, then an insane run. And he, you know, he was a top pitching prospect for a while. He just, he completely faded off the map like 10 years ago. Uh, and, and came back and, and came up as a reliever. Cubs kind of took a page out of the Cardinals book, let him get some bullets in as a reliever, bounce back and forth, and then finally settled in. I mean, people were calling for him to go back to the pen at the beginning of last year, and then he completely turned it around, and he's been an absolute heater uh, since, like, last June. And a little bit of Gossman stuff with him. He, he's uh, 60% on the four seam and then 36% on the slider. So – you know, he's going to ride you in, up. He's moving locations around, but as far as pitch variation is concerned, you know, he's, he's, I have two very, very good major league pitches. You know, the changeup is not a major league pitch, so I don't throw it major league games. I, I, I think that's mm-hmm. the type of mentality of them. That's where the sustainability question would come in for me because when you see him so many times, but if you're willing to throw a four seam down and in to right handed hitters in the big leagues and that four seam fastball average is 92. Well, you just got balls, man, in, in that mix and being able to go up, down. It's also a slightly different look from what you see from starting pitchers, too. So, Yeah, you know, he also moves his four-seamer in different ways, so it's almost like an extra pitch. It's not quite, but it's, it's a little bit different, and every now and then he'll throw a sinker. But you're, you're right. I mean, that's, that's the knock on him. Um, but, uh, I mean, it is – I don't think it'd be that crazy to say he's the most underrated pitcher in baseball this season. Right now, no, absolutely not. One point four five ERA. I think he's second behind Sonny Gray. Uh, absolutely contender for in, in the ratios and the WHIP uh, pitchability guy. And again, Clemmer, like not to tie it back too much to the Mets and all this stuff, but like that's the type of guy that like you know you would hope the Mets still have opportunities to develop him because the reason Justin Seals good now is because he was able to kind of go through those moments and there isn't that pressure. And that's the balance you have to strike. Like if you're chasing championships. How do you get these homegrown guys? He costs seven hundred and forty thousand dollars. He's gonna be if he if he does even start to trend down and say he pitches to a mid three ERA over the next three years, huge win for the player development. Oh yeah, it's huge. Plus you have like cost control and everything else. That's the problem the Mets have right now is we have quite a bit of depth actually when it comes to hitting. I think we, they released the Baseball America's top one hundred list and Mets have Mets have eight guys on it. One of them saying it doesn't count, but seven guys you know, and they're all hitters. We need pitching depth. We just don't have it. I have a question for you guys about the NL Central at large. So I obviously have East Coast bias. I'm a, I'm a Mets fan. I watch a lot of West Coast games because those start after the Mets games are over. So sometimes the Central kind of gets like lost in the mix. Plus, it, I don't know, hasn't been the best division of, of late. Um, but this year, I think it's really interesting because if the Cardinals are shit in the bed like they are, you have the Pirates who probably aren't going to last too much longer, in my opinion there. The Brewers are always good under Craig Council. We talked about that on this show before. The Reds, I don't think are going anywhere this year. They'd just be my Mets today. But my Mets are horrible. But like you have, you have enough teams that I think are making it interesting. I guess where do you guys see? You guys seem like very realistic Cubs fans. You guys are even saying, "Hey, if we need to sell at the deadline, we'll do that." But how do you guys see the Central shaping up? This is a weird year. Yeah, I, I think mean, the, the, no, I was just gonna say you, you kind of nailed it. Here, here's the only, the only thing. I don't believe in the Pirates. I, I can no. give a shit how they started. <laughs> 
uh, the Brewers are always better than they look. And it's the most frustrating thing of being a Cubs fan in the last 10 years. Every single year I go into them, the Brewers don't look that good. And they always overperform. They are like so good at getting more out of their team than they get, uh, than they have on paper. And then the Cardinals, um, they are the most talented team, I would say. They had huge rotation problems. Maybe that gets fixed without Contreras. Um, but when you start as bad as they did, there's a hole to dig yourself out of, and that's going to take time. Uh, so that gives the Cubs an opportunity, and then that sort of leads to the one thing that we've been talking about, which is like if you still have a shot this July, I, I think you – I don't think you're going to get nearly as much for Cody Bellinger. Rental bats never get anything on the trade market. Um, Stroman has an opt out, so it's not really a one and a half year thing. It's like a rental for him. So that's a big difference too. So, you know, if the Cardinals take into July to get back into the race and the Cubs and the Brewers are hanging out in first and second, I think you kind of got to go for it. And I think you feel okay about it. The problem is we have no idea if this is just the, the, the Cubs just gifted the Cardinals their they're a beautiful turnaround. They make the Contreras trade and then they come into Wrigley or the, the Contreras position switch. They come into Wrigley and maybe sweep the Cubs. I mean, that is exactly what they would need to get themselves back in the right track. But they got a lot of ground to make up. So if the Cubs can just figure some of their shit out uh, sooner than later, start to feel good about it. But I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a bad division. You know? There's only thing more... Uh reliable than Craig Council just putting out a consistent team is the fact that the Cardinals are going to win 18 to 22 games at some point in the season. They've done it every year for the last 10 years. Uh, it, it usually happens in August. Like Nolan Arenado's having the worst year of his career. You think that's honestly going to happen forever? I don't know. His back could be fucked up. It, it, it looks like he's played a lot of golf, to be honest with you. It, <laughs> he, the feet are moving all over the place. I know he's got happy feet generally. Uh, but going over to the Brewers, like – they would probably, if if I wanted to adopt my Big Ten mentality for March Madness, where I'd like to see Big Ten teams advance, the Brewers are like a five seed Michigan State under Tom Izzo, and you just know they're going to d up and play hard, and they're tough to score against, and they're just going to grind you in, in into into nothing. Their defensive metrics, and I don't really love defensive metrics, however. Their defensive like war and wins above and rating shit is three times higher than the second team in baseball. So like that's enough for you to say they obviously defend at an extremely elite level. And when you do something like that elite and they obviously have great pitching, mm -hmm. it's very hard to slump. It's it's very so the Cubs, it's like you'd have to get you'd have to get hot and you'd have to you'd have to notably win the series. This, this season series against the Brewers, I don't think that's realistic. And regardless, I don't think it matters because I still think whoever comes out of the Central, the top of baseball is so much higher. The top of baseball is like the early 2000s NBA. Like that, the top of baseball is so much better than the next crop. And yeah, we can say whatever we want about the Phillies getting to the World Series. They got their fucking shit pounded after the second game. Okay. Yeah, so, but I'm going to disagree. Here's where I disagree with you. First of all, you're 100% right about that. But I... Like, I don't care. I want to go to the playoffs this year. Like, I, I, I don't care. Like, I don't care. I will take a NLDS and a uh, pick for Cody Bellinger shooting down the qualifying offer instead of whatever A-ball pitcher we're going to get from whoever we trade, the Astro. Like, whatever. I want to play in the playoffs. And although you're right, the Cubs, even if they won, by a miracle won this division – they are nowhere near the best team in baseball, but it's baseball. Literally every single year, the playoffs are like the, it's, it's the only sport where you have no idea who's going to win a playoff series. I mean, it just does not work like football or basketball where the best team is just like, you know, they're, they're probably going to win. Like bulls aren't going to beat the bucks last year. In the playoffs. Like, it wasn't going to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, Still I don't know, man, I, I, I'd watch and I miss October baseball and I would do whatever. <laughs> I, I would go back. Um, it's different, though, than it was in 2021 when the Cubs had all these expiring assets uh, and were clearly going down. Right now, we're still moving in the right direction. So I'm cool with adding at this deadline to make a run. Um, you don't, I, I'm, I don't think we need to do this boom and bust thing forever. We did it 
and we're in a pretty good spot. Got probably as many 75 to 200, top 75 to 200 prospects as any team in baseball. Not a ton at the top, a ton in that 75 to 200 range. Those are the guys nowadays that are traded at the deadline for impact starters, relievers, whatever else you need. Um, so they have the pieces to get stuff done, plenty of depth. Um, their Iowa roster is like full of guys that have played at the big league level already and can fill in when there's needs. That they're set up to make a run to the playoffs if they can get to July and still be in the race. I just don't know if we're going to get there. And if they're not, then yeah, you got to kind of cut loose. But um, I, I think they might be. Um, well said. Well said. Marmol in St. Louis. Oli Marmol, right? So this guy, they won 92 games last year. Didn't win a playoff game. Obviously off to a 13-24 and 24 start now. How long is the leash on him? You know, the Cardinals fired, what, Mike Schultz? Uh, yeah, they fired ago. Schilt, but they Marmol had been hanging around that clubhouse for a long time, and and I think that that's a player's clubhouse, you know, like it just that's the way it was when I think going back to when Larusa left, like the Cardinals are just a player's clubhouse because Yachty's been in there, Wainwright's been in there forever. Um, well, some of those guys they, are gone. I mean, Pujols. I know, but I'm saying like when they moved on from Schilt, it was because they didn't want him in there anymore. And that's a guy who took him to the playoffs. He wasn't terrible. Like a lot of what, they won like own, 17 yeah. games in a row or something, right? Yeah, they had this but crazy they, stretch. I mean, it's bizarre. And I, you know what's even stranger though? He hasn't gotten a job since. You know, a manager no, job. I know he's on a coaching staff, but he yeah. he hasn't gotten a managerial job, which I I thought he'd be scooped up instantly, and he hasn't. So that might maybe give some credence to the Cardinals. Going and there's your work. Chris Clemmer conspiracy theory of the night. There could be something behind the scenes <laughs> there. There could be something we don't know about. I think it's more along the lines of like when, when uh, you know, when the team promotes the offensive coordinator and fires the head coach because they're nervous someone else is going to hire him. Yeah. Like Ali Marmel, I think, was a really, really hot name. Um, I don't think if – I think you got to – listen, he's not out there pitching. Those guys fucking stink. Those yeah. ERAs are awful. awful. You know, if they, if they were losing games because of bullpen management or if the line, like Nolan Arenado was a first ballot generational, one of the greatest third basemen of all time. He's having a horrendous season. He's one of the worst players in baseball. So you're like, that's not Oliver Marmol's fault. Like if anything, if anything, you want to stick behind your guys. Now, when you fire a guy, who do you replace him with? So that's the other thing too. Like they, when they fired the, Schilt, they had Marmol. Like I, do they have another guy sitting there? Well, I was going to say that the Cardinals – this is the other – I mean, again, I don't know if I'm coming off as such a salty Cubs fan, but they stick behind their guys like more than most. Like they have this – they – half the time they're right, but half – you know, they think everything they do is the absolute best version of it, and that's why Ali Marmo's not going anywhere right now. Like I don't think he's okay. – I don't think his seat is even hot is is my take on it. Um, How you can't that- ever ignore a start like that, but – that's fair, and that's a fair point. The Cardinals stuck with Rusa forever. You know, they do have kind of a history of that, even back to you know Whitey Herzog. They stuck, they stick with these guys for Joe Torre for they stick with these guys for a pretty long time. Now, the Cardinals has been such a weird year. I don't mean to focus so much on the Cardinals, but th- it's so bizarre to me. Like the Jordan Walker, you know, now he's in AAA and he can't he can't barely hit my weight, which which is that's bad. Uh, you know, he he's he seems kind of lost. Seems like everything the Cardinals typically do has completely one eighty on them. And I, I just don't – I don't know, man. I'll tell you right now. I was sitting at the game tonight, Clemmer, and I had yeah. a moment. I had a moment. I was sitting in the Steve Bartman section, and I looked out in the outfield, and I'm like, fucking Donovan, Carlson, Newt Barr, DeYoung, Edmund. I mean, just classic St. Louis Cardinal, slightly above average players littered all over the place. But stupid Jack, names. Jack Flair. Yeah. <laughs> Kisner with two ends. Figure it out, buddy. Uh, but but honestly, Jack Flaherty looked looked sharp enough tonight and had enough sw- had enough like nasty whiffs where you're like, son of a bitch, here comes eight great starts from this guy. Like he's I think he's pitching to get out of there too. Uh so there's some motivating factors there. But I had a moment tonight where I looked at the Cardinals and for as bad as they are, I was like, this is such a classic Cardinals 93 win team. That's impossible to beat in August because you've got these homegrown players that are meshing together. You know, Newt Bar's only going to get better. I know he's got some issues in the peripherals and a lot, you know, but they they stick with these guys. This is the mix that once you get, that's why I said the Michigan State mix. It's like they don't care. Like they're just going to get better and they're going to go on this run. That's what I look at when I see the Cardinals book. 
it pains me to say that, Michael. I'm sorry. I have to say no, that the talk only, positively about them, but the the only thing that you can look at them and say like like po- like positive from a Cubs fan perspective is their pitching pipeline is drying up. It's not the same, but their position players again with stupid names that come up and hit three homers in a series against the Cubs, they're never ending and that it's going to haunt me until I'm 90 or whatever. I always yeah. bring it up and I always get kind of a lot of eye roll, especially among younger Barstool fans, but like the 65 Yankees, like that was the year when it all went south for them. The same thing happened with the Braves. You know, you had the Maddox, Glavin guys dominate. Eventually things end. And watching the Cardinals kind of keep stepping, you know, on the rakes in the yard and keep smashing in the face, you start to wonder, like, is this the end? But then they have a, you know, a start to the week this week, and you kind of define that Cardinal baseball. Maybe it was all back to Wilson Contreras, just not knowing how to handle his pitching staff. Uh, so I'm kind of where a week ago I was like, I don't, this, this smells like a dying corpse. Now I'm starting to maybe see a little bit of a pulse with these guys, especially the way they've been playing you guys the last couple of days. No, Certainly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's that they've listen, it has not been great. The, the whole handling of the Contreras thing was terrible. And there cannot be good energy going on there. I mean, they were talking about him being in the outfield and then they like just backtracked on that. Um, Contreras is out there saying like, I'm not pointing fingers, but the pitcher's got to execute. And then the front office is saying, we're not trying to say it's all Contreras' fault, but if the pitchers wanted Contreras behind the plate, he'd be behind the plate. It's like, this is not the St. Louis Cardinals that have a tight ship and everyone's telling the line. I mean, it is, it is a shit show. It's just, they beat the Cubs twice, so we're all like losing our minds. But, you know, we it shouldn't we shouldn't change our opinion on how bad they've started after two games or against a team like the Cubs that are absolutely struggling at the moment. They've had they had a really rough two weeks, so it's like they just hit them at the right time. Um, I still think they got a lot of ground to make up, and if the starting pitching doesn't make a huge turnaround after Contreras, they're going to be screwed. I mean, they have offense; that's fine. Um, their starting pitching is just hasn't been great. And that was the concern coming into the year. Um, Michael, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this deep dive on the NL Central, particularly the Cubs. Uh, I have one last point I'd like to make and just share. Like, I think we mentioned it off the top. I don't know if people are acknowledging just the transition the Cardinals are in. No one's even mentioned the Pujols chaos that they brought back into the clubhouse and that energy and vibe and then saying goodbye to Yachty, but then Wainwright's still lingering around. So now this is the first time Wayno is really the, the alpha male, and he's got he's a strong, sentimented man. And I bet there is some something going on with how that rubs off on the pitching staff. Uh, that said, there, the more we talk about this, the more I realize, though, when they rebound from this, and they will because they can't be this bad. They just can't. Uh, they're going to be ferocious. They're, they're really, there's going to be that stretch, whether it's coming down at the end of the second or end of the first half, early second half, um, where they rattle off 18 or whatever. I mean, that's, that's, that's not the team that shows up in October though. So anyways, yeah. I Michael, mean, hopefully we didn't, we didn't start it right now, man. That's, that's the only thing that I'm hoping. No, we definitely did. We definitely, we, we <laughs> were like, we should, we should do some serious Cubs banter while they're still hovering around 500. This will be good. And, um, lo and behold, the curse of Barstool Baseball. Michael, one more time, where can people follow your stuff? I, and I want to give another person, like, I just, I love your stuff. As a Cubs fan, uh, you're just a tremendous source of information. Bleacher Nation does a great job. You obviously know your shit inside out. Where can people uh, follow you some more? Yeah, so you can follow me uh, at Bleacher Nation, BleacherNation.com, at Bleacher Nation on Twitter, or me personally at Michael underscore Cerami uh, on Twitter. That's where I'm tweeting, you know, Every other day, it's either a swear word or we're going straight to November <laughs> baseball. It's, it's one or the other. Uh, and, and again, the Bleacher Nation website is old school blogging, updated around the clock every day. Uh, and I know there's still like that's a you guys do an amazing job on that. And thank you for keeping that part of the Internet alive. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're definitely going to be talking to you again about the NL Central. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Michael. So that was Michael. I. I'm happy we could do some Cubs stuff. I like talking about the Cubs, obviously. Yeah, I got to talk some Cardinals. I got to, I mean, we talked about Justin Steele. It's great. Uh, you know, we got, we got to talk about guys that I don't know are getting the pub among, you know, the mainstream, you know, super hot, you know, I, I, guys that you don't hear about every day but are having huge seasons and also just teams that I think have gone kind of under the radar. The National Central has been kind of the, I don't know, the Dodgers, the Mets, you know, the sexy teams yeah. you hear about. But the Central is – is alive and kicking. I think the most interesting central we've seen in over a decade. 
now when the playoffs start, you know, they'll obviously be whoever makes it out of the central will be tremendous underdogs in the playoff landscape. But to your point, you know, they still got to go out and play this year. And there are good storylines there. Um, you know, one thing I'm interested in is showing up next Wednesday and getting that deep on, you know, like I, I have tons of questions on the Giants. I really I, like every time I watch a Giants play, I'm just so interested in like what the hell is going on with them. That's uh, obviously, team. like I said, we talked about the Dodgers a lot. Um, the Rockies, you know, do they still have that home field competitive advantage? And um, what the fuck's going on with Zeke Tovar, some of those younger dudes? We'll worry about that stuff next week. Uh, for now, I just want to encourage you guys, please go subscribe to the stuff. This is up on YouTube, obviously up on the feed. Uh, if you have a baseball friend, share it with him. We're doing our best to give you guys the most, like, you know, just sharp. We just want to be sharp and competent, and uh, we'll worry about the fucking gimmicks later. Is that the end of the show? I don't know. What are you, you, you going <laughs> to leave me bailing on that, or, or, or here's know, a gimmick? You're just uh, now you're going to leave me fucking hanging. You know? I, I, what do you yes, have? We are working hard. <laughs> Take whatever focus. you want. I mean, <laughs> I, I got to tell people to subscribe to stuff, or else I'm going to get an email. That says, I know. Hey, could you do, I know. Do, I know. Make I'm, sure I, you I, remind people that this is yes. like the thing to subscribe to because it's relatively new. But if you want subscribe, me to edit it out, subscribe I'll take now. It. No, fuck. I'll take it out. No, you're right. It's oh, lame. I know. I <laughs> this is funny too. I think we can do this in. The whole thing's, you know, it's like. I like this. I'll, I'll go to our production office right now, which is. You're fucking looking at it, pal. I got to watch the swearing, too. So a little post-game stuff. Like, I just. It's been a long day. Castellani's in town. The American League show. We have a home run. I'll just say it's White Sox Day. Me, Castellani, and White Sox Dave on Friday. I might. Might be the most anticipated American League conversation I've ever. I've been licking my chops to get these two together. So um, that's exciting. What are you going to do this week, Chris? Uh, I'm going to uh, cry about the Mets. And then um, that's and then just dread next week for when the Mets play the race. So it's going to be a lot of me watching the Mets probably lose to really bad teams. And then get, you know, my tears ready for Tuesday when the Mets get just throttled by the Rays for the week. So throttled. That's a it's great so dude. That's a great word to describe your team getting their ass kicked on a baseball field. They got fucking throttled. Yeah, it's gonna be rough. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that's my exciting week. Yes. <laughs> okay, and we talked about on the uh, Monday power ranking show is the uh it, um it ain't over movie um for Yogi Bear, the documentary. So I want what I would like to do is you me Castellani, some mix. Pick a day, pick a show time, okay. and then we'll we'll try and get if five people show up, ten people show up, and then we'll do like a tailgate in the parking lot beforehand, uh, and just like hang out. Honestly, if like nobody shows up and it's just the three of us, but that's something I thought about today that I want to do. So I don't uh, know what it ain't over Yogi Bear. They're first in their first they're our first partner, they're first our brand partner. I would love to go see a movie with you guys, and especially that one. I mean, Yogi Bear is the best. Um, I don't know what parking lot you'll find here in New York City, but we could, uh, you know, find a sidewalk and do a tail, do a sidewalk gate. Is that how it is out there? Yeah. Well, you what you usually do is you go to a bar, or whatever, before the game or, or before the movie or after the movie. You can talk about the movie. It's always good. I mean, Yogi Berra is gonna be a plenty of stuff to talk about. Charging me an arm and a leg for a great tasting last filling. That's Manhattan. That's a junk. Fine. If we're out there, say la vie. When in Rome, I thought they said tri-state area. There's not a parking lot in Jersey. Isn't that part of the tri-state? I, I, Staten I, Island. I, City. I, uh, oh, trivia question for you. What okay. was the last team Yogi Berra played for? Probably the Mets. That's right. He did. He played in 1965. He played a couple of games with the Mets. Wasn't he a player manager? They had, they stuck him out he in the field? He was not. He was a coach, player coach. He did mm -hmm. become manager of the Mets when Gil Hodges died in 72. Do you think player managers can come back? I don't know. The last one, Pete, Pete Rose, of course, uh, and his last season was 86. So I was only six. So I don't really remember a player manager. I would doubt it very much. I've always kind of wanted it to happen just because I've never really seen it. Yeah, I could see like the Oakland A's doing it or the Vegas A's or something like something to cut payroll just so they could pay the electricity bill or so something. Right. You, no, they, they could pay the exterminator and the sewage people to come in if they make, you know, uh, I don't even know who would be the player manager on that team. Maybe, I don't know. I don't even know who's the veteran leadership they would have to be the player manager. That team is rough. Shay Langleyers, he's 25, but maybe he could do it. Thank you very much for that because that reminds me. I researched this thing to make a TikTok and little inside baseball as we're doing the post show here. Like TikToks are way harder than people realize because you have to like 
fucking. I mean, if you want to be good, like if you want them to not be just shit on for like, hey, that sucks. Like, there's so, uh, some level of effort that goes into it. And I've learned the more original the idea, like if I'm just repurposing something that I saw has a less chance. But that's how smart the algorithm is. You got to have fresh. I could be wrong, but fuck it. This is what's motivating me to get in the CSV files and find my. So I did find something. I want to present to you the five most average players in Major League Baseball uh, through the season today. Okay. These are the five most average guys. I'll tell you how I got here. Uh, this is our last segment. Hey, guys, go subscribe to the show. We're awesome. Even if Clemmer doesn't like it when I say it. Uh, okay, number five is Gunnar Henderson. Uh, the wow. what, what I did is I took baseball reference and I took fan graphs. I threw them into one, one sheet, and then we came up with a, a formula. We kicked out all the bad wars and good wars. We narrowed it down from minus 0.3 to 0.3. And then I took the weighted runs created plus, and I narrowed that to like 80 to 100. Uh, and then I went to, um, offensive and defensive war, which aren't perfect metrics by any standard, but it's just, like just kicked out the outliers. So like the absolute dogs, the guys who like, you know, I don't, I don't like to name names here, but the guys that can't field. And then the guys that are obviously way above average defensively, because if you are very good at something or very bad at something, you know what you're not, you're not average. So this is a pure, like, I want the average, the most average guys. Gunnar Henderson's fifth. He's got a 100 weighted runs created plus. His weighted on base average is is identical with league average at 306. Uh, he's got one tenth of win above replacement um, from Fangraphs and a little bit less than one from Baseball Reference. He does walk extremely high, so I don't like when you do something very well. Uh, I think that, that's a win. I think if you're 22 years old, your first season in baseball, if you can be average, that's great. So I think that's a. I think that's a. A guy, I think if you're a young player in your first year, you should strive to be on a list like this. So that's a, that's great for the Orioles. It's great for Gunnar Henderson. He's got a bright future. If you can have your first year be average. And now here's your going to now thank you for teeing that up because number four is Charlie Blackman, man. 36 years old. 36 that's other, years that's old. The other end of the, of the, you know, of the, of the pendulum there. So, yeah. So, right. But honestly, if you're Charlie Blackman, you know, you're you're kind of aging out of this a little bit. I think you're just trying to stay in the, you know, trying to stay as a starter, maybe being league average, especially for such a shitty team like the Rockies. That's not so bad. So, having said the Rockies also beat the hell by Mets, but that's I would say Charlie Blackman, not so bad. Now, I have ten th- categories. Once I've gotten to the mix, it pulls out like thirty players. So then I put together ten categories that I deem to be major league average that are easy to pull, and then I gave guys points for how close they were to major league average. So we've got walk percentage, which is 9% strikeout, which is 23. Isolated slugging. If you don't know that, look it up. I'm not going to tell you about it now. Uh, obviously, BABIP, average, OBP, slugging, OPS, weighted on base, and uh, weighted runs, created plus. I'm throwing a lot at you guys. I told you I was in the fucking spreadsheets. Uh, Charlie Blackman is exactly average in a remarkable five of those 10 categories. And, and when I say exactly average, it's like within 5% of, you know, so like he's slugging 400. Major League average slugs 407. Oh, perfect, Charlie. You are so average. Uh, this, the walk rate's right on par. Now, he doesn't strike out as much as I would like for him to be more average. Number three, Shane Langliers. And he's kind of an outlier because he swings hard and, and his slugging percentage is high at 431. Um, but overall, dude, when you take the defense and the offense, like he's purely – what you see, I mean, it's like you're not you're not getting anything other than what you see. A guy who gets on base under a 300 clip and just absolutely fucking mashes mistakes, but doesn't get them very often. Yeah, see, I think that's where it, it gets difficult because an average offensive output for a catcher, it, to me, is a win. Um, now, you're saying his defense might not be that great either, and I, I've seen it firsthand. It, it's not particularly fantastic, but... Um, but for the A's, that's a huge win, right? Because they have they don't have any play. Their their whole team is below average. So once again, another another W so far. And I think they have to stick about. They were I think they were flirting with them in left field a little bit. But the emergence of Brent Rooker, which we will talk about in the American League show. <laughs> um, holy that guy, is that guy, he's become the best hitter in baseball. One of them, which is bizarre. There's there's two players in the history of the SEC that have won the triple crown. Rafael Palmero, Brent Rooker. Yeah, Brent Rooker before this season though was uh, has a terrible track record. But you know, thirty fifth overall pick, he shit on the Cape Cod League, even though he struck out. He struck out a lot in the Cape Cod League, still hit over three hundred. He's just give him time, dude. You're seeing what you Brent might be right. He might be one of those sluggers who just needed to find his space. You know, I just think back to him with the Twins, and it was just like, oh, that guy. That was tough. That was a tough watch. 
Number two is Mark Canna. Do I need to explain that? No, and he is the epitome of average. This is what like, kind of I was saying. Like I, on a really good team, ideally he's a fourth outfielder. You know, if you're a really good team, like the Mets ideally would have been, um, you know, you don't want necessarily that guy starting for every day. But Mark Canna, that makes total sense. Mark Canna is average immortalized. The most average player, though, and I know you're already going to talk me off this, but the offense is down and up. He doesn't slug nearly enough to make up for being, like, not horrible defensively is C.J. Abrams. He is dead on balls. Babbitt, average, OBP, weighted on base, K percent. He's a little underneath on the walk percentage if he could walk a little bit more. Um, his net wins above replacement is .1. He's as the output is just so utterly perfectly average. And this isn't shitting on these guys because we spend so much time celebrating the best in this game and then marginalizing the worst. But there's like 80% of baseball are fucking guys like this. Eight, most of this game are just guys that are like collecting a check for nine years, honing their craft, doing the best they can, trying to get that 20 million, you know, maybe I mean, stick around for the pension. For so. Abrams. This is great for CJ. He's only 22. Last year, uh, he played 90 games. He was not even close to a league average hitter. You're seeing improvement in his game, which is exactly what we want from Washington. If you told the Nationals, hey, by the end of the year, CJ Abrams is going to be an average player in the big leagues, they'd be like, uh, yeah, I'll take that. He's a 22-year-old infielder. He, his future is very bright. That, that's a, that should be music to every Nationals fan's ears, is that CJ Abrams could be an average player this year. Put together a full year in the baseball. He learns what it's like to play from March to October in your, you know, late September in the big leagues and puts together 150 hits, has the league average season. He comes in next year ready to go. That's a big these Abrams and Henderson should be that's a huge win to be on a list like this. Mark All right. I, I fucked up, dude. Hand up. I screwed up. I should have ran this list past you before. I should have done qualitative analysis. I was too heavy in the spreadsheets. The CF <laughs> the CSV the gotcha. files were too. <laughs> I didn't take time to think about age and experience. And the more I do, the more Mark Canna stands out. It's got to be Mark Canna one. It's got to oh, be Mark, Mark Canna. Canna. He's the guy. most yeah. average. I mean, CJ Matt Abrams. Verlaine from the Tigers was compelling, but I didn't want to have to like introduce Matt Verlaine to people. So um, I can see Abrams though. And if national fans are hopefully not aren't too concerned, if like, August, September, we see a real decline in his game. That's very normal. A lot of these young players, when they're playing 162 for the first time, you do start to see that post-All-Star. But that's okay. That's how, how it works. And then next year he comes in, he's 23. He had a full season under his belt where he was pretty decent. You're going to see he's a player to keep an eye on. Obviously, I know everybody already is. He's a top prospect. But that's a really good take for in the Soto deal if you have a guy like that. So he average, you know, and then they got Mackenzie Gore, who, who's off to a decent start as well. So, they got some nice pieces in that trade. Uh, C.J. Abrams, that's a bright future. That, that's great. Oh, yeah, and Gunnar Henderson, too. Yeah, Mackenzie Gore looked he looked sharp. Looks like yeah. a guy who can go out and, you know, dominate I mean, a major league lineup. And it's just going to take him a little bit of time going out there and making mistakes. Like, guys got to screw up. Guys have to screw up. And then, and then it, the difference is who are the guys that care enough that when they go home and they're thinking about it, when they get to the ballpark the next day, they want to be better. That ultimately is the difference in, like, I know this is lame just because I don't I don't know him, but you watch Mackenzie Gore pitch, and every time you see him on the mound, he looks better than he was the last time, and that's so encouraging. The kids, he's so young and powerful. Like, looks looks so smooth. Oh. He does. He look. You know what he looks like this year? And same with CJ. When I, I the, the games that I've seen him uh, when he's played the Mets, they look like major leaguers. Where last year they kind they really didn't, especially CJ. He looked like he was lost. He looked like someone who should be in AAA. This year, he looks like a major leaguer. Mackenzie Gore has an uh, ERA plus of 115. He's, you know, he's out there. He's a dependable starter. He's made, and it's only seven starts, but it's been seven pretty good starts. He looks like a major leaguer. If the Nationals would keep collecting guys like that, that's how you build a winner. Um, so if I'm a Nationals fan, I'm elated. I know they're 15 and 20, and it's going to be a loss year for them. That team stinks. But if you can keep on getting those kind of guys, that's exciting. That's fun. So good for CJ Abrams for being average. Yeah, hey, I I could have done a better job on the average. I'm going to pair this one down to guys that have like you, you should be. You're definitely average. Like CJ Abrams could be an all star one. He could be a very good player. He oh, I think be, CJ, he's on the yeah, track. He's, to be an yeah, right. Like he's, he's Gunnar Henderson. Those guys will be all stars before they're thirty. Rattling me right now. I'm getting 
running up the score on how unaverage this list is. So I will be back next week with a more average list of more average players. Or how about this? If you want me to research something, put put me to the test, guys. I'm comfortable on the on the keypad. I worked a decade in Excel. I wrote those for no, I didn't. I don't know if I was writing macro formulas, but I got I got V lookups. I got pivot tables. Just send me down that path. Uh, Clemmer, this is the National League show. I had a blast with you. Post show got a little. I mean, it's you and me. This is going to happen. This is how it goes. It gets a little wonky. Um, but, hey, we're talking to C.J. Abrams. We're talking, you know, it's an NL show. We're talking to Henderson. But, like, that's what this, ideally, this show is going to be on Wednesdays uh, is probably some deep dives where, like, this, the Monday shows are going to be a bit more, like, typical baseball talk, which is good. And But more, but this is going to be where we some, do some deep dives. And, like, we talked about, you know, Justin Steele, who's a top-tier talent right now, but, you're going to get some some random names in this show, I hope. Yeah, and then when my idea is like postseason rolls around, like we're not doing – the storylines are here. I want to start, you know, like you, that's the beauty of baseball is these just like different little stories and how they interweave so that as the year plays out and, you know, we we did a great job with the Cardinals today. I'm really prepared to talk more about the Cardinals when that next big story drops or when that next run comes or – um, and the same can be said a lot, and that's that's kind of what we're after here. So, th- hey, thanks for volunteering your time. If you are listening to this right now, um, I got this out on time, and that's a big fucking deal. That's a huge win for Barcelona baseball um, because the more the more we get this out, like the better off everything's going to be, right? That's that's the mentality right now. We are volume shooters. We are having a great time. We appreciate everyone for tuning in and your support this far. Please go, uh, please go share the show. Thanks, guys. See you. Uh, I'll see you guys. Oh, that's fucking time. brutal. Come on. Give me one more. Come on. You got to. Oh, no, I got confused the days. I was going to say, I'll see. I'll talk to you folks on uh, on Monday, but you're going to have this show with Castellani and the White Sox Dave uh, in a couple of days. Yeah, I mean, I hopefully, hopefully the American League shows and as those things play out, like I would like to facilitate, like where you were with me and Michael in the, in the Cubs. Like I would like to facilitate a great conversation between Castellani and White Sox, Dave. I don't think I have to separate those two. I don't. I just two want to get. The only thing I want is a promise that by the end of the night, those two guys are at a bar trying to pick up women together. That's all I want. That's all That's all I want. Um, A promise I will deliver. I all promise. Right. All right. That's what I do. Uh, this is Barcelona Baseball. We'll see you guys on Friday.